This is the Fifth Estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you may have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 16th of March 2021 and I am 2J. I'm JM. And I am Miss Kay. Again, in case you missed today's headlines, here they are. Mm -hmm. Daily Nation, the shocking murder of a key witness. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Standard, Jubilee ejects Ruto from top party post. And The Star, murdered NLC officer, witness in a 122 million shilling case. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm really saddened by this story about the National Land Commission Deputy Commission, Communications Director, Jenny yeah. Parambua, and that she was found murdered. And my heart goes out to her family. We really wish them mm, comfort the best, in this yeah. really hard time. However, I'd like us to discuss the standard. Mm. Um, the fate of Deputy President William Ruto as Jubilee Party Deputy Leader now lies with our president. Mm. Why is this? The National Management Committee, NMC, made the bold decision to remove him from Deputy Party Leader and they oh, forwarded yeah. their decision to the National Executive Council, the NEC, NEC chaired by the President. Mm -hmm. So now all hangs on the fate of our President. <laughs> but why do they want to remove our Deputy President? Mm. And I think we've gone through some of these things before, especially when there were some MPs, where they nominated MPs who were tried to, uh, they tried to remove them from Jubilee as well. But as for the Deputy President, I think that the reasons for want to re wanting to remove William Ruto as Deputy Party Leader are very clear. He has been disloyal to the president and to the party that gave him access to the seat that he occupies. And the law is very clear that a person shall not be a member of more than one political party at the same time. Mm. And all of this comes from the Political Parties Act of 2011 that defines what it means to be in more than one political party. So just, you know, generally, if one forms a political party, if one joins another political party, or if one is deemed to have promoted the ideology of another political party, the law is clear. If you do this, you have effectively resigned from your post. Mm. But it's not that simple. And this is probably what Ruto is betting on. Mm -hmm. The law is vague on whether these actions apply to the deputy president himself. Mm -hmm. And because of this, we have created a strong second in command who is answerable to no one but himself. The law has given him carte blanche to be the president's right hand man, but execute his own agenda with no consequences. So in his book, The Consiglergy, Leading from the Shadows, Richard Heitner dissects the role of the consigliere, And this is an Italian word for advisor or counselor. And in his book, he writes about two types of C executives. Those who have taken advantage of um, the number two role to prepare themselves for the top job. Mm -hmm. And then those who value the position for its own sake. And I think it's quite clear where William Ruto stands. He has taken advantage of his number two role to prepare himself for the top job. Mm. But inherently, there's actually nothing wrong with this, right? Most deputy or vice presidents make agreements based on the promise of being a leader tomorrow. Mm. But when you use your position to be divisive, to stir up party politics, and to undermine the good work of your number one, you deserve to be removed from your post. So just like Ms. K just said, the ball is now in the president's court as we await the decision of the National Executive Council. Mm. The question will ultimately be whether it's better to have Ruto on the inside peeing out or on the outside peeing in. Yes, yes, and yes. just so that I can mention any note of impeachment, I think the point remains that the deputy president is layered you know, within the party structure. The position of deputy president is layered within the party structure, but also within the constitution. And so without the backing of the party, which is what you know, evidently has now happened to the deputy president, mm -hmm. the only thing standing between him and being a mere civilian is the promise of impeachment. So I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's very true. And yes, TJ, you are right. The removal of the deputy president is not that simple. Mm -hmm. And allow me to elaborate using a case that was heard and determined by the High Court on the removal of a governor. Yeah. And this governor was Okothobado, who was elected as governor of Migori County on 
a PDP ticket in the 2013 general election. But at some point before the 2017 election, Obado formally tendered his written resignation from PDP and applied to be a member of the great ODM. <laughs> he wanted to go to Canon. Then George Obuya Owur, who lost to him in 2013, mm -hmm. went to court to seek a declaration that because Obado had resigned from the party that sponsored him in the election, PDP, the Migori County governor's seat should be declared vacant. Mm. And the court had to answer an important question, and the question was this. Does the seat of the governor become vacant if the governor resigns from the political party on which the, the, the ticket that he was elected? Yes. Well, the short answer is no. Mm. According to the court, the constitution clearly specifies the circumstances under which a governor may be removed and the circumstances under which the seat of a governor may be declared vacant. And party hopping <laughs> is not one of them. Which means, <laughs> it's not a criterion. And what he also said is that if the party was to remove, if, if the constitution, the makers of the constitution had wanted such a criteria to be put in, then they would have clearly and categorically stated it expressly. Mm. But what does this have to do with the removal of the deputy president, mm. you ask? The judges in that case, that same case on party hopping, on said, said quoted the, com the constitutional provisions and they compared the provisions of the constitution for the vacation of office of a governor to those for the vacation of office of the president. Mm -hmm. And those are the same provisions that would apply to the removal of the deputy president. Mm -hmm. Why? So they say because the governor and the president and by inference mm -hmm. the deputy president perform executive functions, they work for every resident mm. in the county or the nation as mm. dictated by the constitution, irrespective of their party affiliations. Yeah. So the DP gets to keep his seat for now, impeachment notwithstanding, but the court clearly said that an MP or an MCA who is removed from that seat, from his party, if the seat is vacant, mm. so Tanga Tanga MPs, beware. Yeah. You will lose your seat. <laughs> so the deputy president you're saying is, not going anywhere. No, not for now. Not okay. at least from the not position of deputy you can president. Sit yeah. Okay, okay. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, yeah. Today, yes, yes, today, I will give one of uh, Aesop's fables. The story is of the old lion. So one day, a crafty old lion was unable to feed itself and pretended to be sick. And according to this fable, the lion made sure that the entire jungle was informed of his sickness. And he did this through a quote-unquote radio announcement, <laughs> which went something like this. Attention, please. Wanyama Pori, this is the king of the jungle speaking. I am gravely ill. Mm -hmm. Visiting hours are between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. Please come see me. <laughs> and so <laughs> the animals came to see him one by one to express their sorrow. But as they did so, the lion ate them up. Ooh. And then a rumor began to spread that some animals have disappeared. And so the fox, which was just as crafty as the lion, became suspicious. And it decided to visit the lion. So the fox stood outside the den at, the, uh, at a respectable distance, however, and asked uh, how the lion was doing. And the lion said, I am very well. Uh, but why are you standing outside? Come and talk to me. And the fox said, uh, no thanks. I have noticed that there are many footprints entering your cave, but no trace of any returning. <laughs> now, we liken this crafty old lion to President Uhuru Kenyatta. You see, there are two things to note here. The first is a lesson from Nicola Machiavelli, who observed that the lion cannot protect himself from traps and the fox cannot defend himself from wolves. Mm. And so therefore, one must therefore uh, be a fox to recognize traps and a lion mm. to frighten the wolves. And our president is the only man in Kenyan politics who perfectly combines the qualities of the lion and the fox. Yes. And that is why he is the most lethal politician in Kenya today. Number two. Although the president seems to have, an, uh, have taken it easy on his rogue number two, and although he seems not to have cracked the whip sufficiently on these Tanga Tanga rebels, 
his cave at State House will soon be a kitchen, a k k kitchen geo. Mm -hmm. Kitchen geo is a slaughterhouse. <laughs> yeah. So like the old lion, he will continue to eat the young political animals in Tanga Tanga, and only the foxes will survive. Mm. But be sure, the deputy president is still not going to survive. Yeah, he's not going to survive. We have a three-part criteria that we use to judge the headlines for you. We ask ourselves, is the headline topical, or speculative, repetitive, or groundbreaking and thoughtful, or just plain lazy? Um, out of respect, I will just park Hard, the yeah. Daily Nation mm. and Understood. the Star. But for giving us many thoughts, what do we think about the standard? What was that headline again? Jubilee ejects Ruto from top party post. Factual, to the point. <laughs> Our right? winning headline. <laughs> and there you winning have it. Headline. We have a winning headline from The Standard. <laughs> and now on to our final thought. But before we get there, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Mm. And now our final thought. Today is inspired by a book entitled Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events, written by Robert J. Schiller. So in a world where we have these things called internet troll farms yeah. that attempt to um, influence foreign elections, like happened with uh, the Russians in 2016 with the American election, yes. mm -hmm. the author asks us, can we afford to ignore the power of how viral stories affect our economies and economics? Mm. So in this book, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist and best-selling author Robert Schiller offers a new way to think about these things, the economy and also economic change. He argues that by studying popular stories that affect individual and collective decision making and behavior, these things really have the potential to improve our ability to predict, mm -hmm. prepare for, and lessen the damage of recessions, depressions, and other major economic events. Yeah. And he calls this understanding narrative economics. And he defines them, these narrative economics, as contagious stories. He says like it's a mm. song that can't get you can't get out of your head. Yeah. But he's like, even though you know a song just kind of elicits thoughts and emotions, yes. these narrative economics, they can induce actions, they can make people act upon them. And so he talks about a popular phrase um, used on social media that is, facts do not care about your feelings. And I think that's quite true. <laughs> but he says that in this book, he wants to convince you of the opposite, that economic facts are actually driven by our feelings. Mm. And you know, these contagious stories have the potential to make us make economic decisions very differently. And so he talks about how we have these beliefs that, have we been, that we've been told are true and that's how they happen, that stocks can only go up, that housing prices never go down, that big firms are too big to fail. And he says that whether this is true or not, these stories are transmitted by word of mouth, by the media, and mm. increasingly by social media, and they really drive the economy and how things happen. So we've been told these set of truths that we think are true and therefore we act upon them. And so I actually want to give a story that is from January 2021, from this year. And it's about a company called GameStop and what happened when it entered into this volatile economic you know, position. And so GameStop is a retailer that is facing the same pressure that so many um, companies are, hap um, are going through right now. So we have shopping trends are changing based on the pandemic, but just also global trends. Everything is going online. And so Wall Street investors had bet heavily that the company was going to tank. And they said that this brick and mortar model that this company had was not going to last. It was doomed. But not everyone agreed. And so around the same time, you have these members of a popular stock market trend, like this, uh, sorry, a thread where they would discuss and give each other ideas. They decided that they were going to encourage others to invest in this company. Mm -hmm. And so they said that the big, you know, big money men, those big investors had gotten it wrong and that this GameStop company was incredibly undervalued. So what happens is the price of GameStop rose as much as 1,700% mm. over the course of like one week. So as these small investors really pushed for um, the GameStop stock to rise through viral online posts, you have these large investors who had thought that it would tank having to pay out all this money to balance the trade that they thought would go the opposite way. So you're having the little guy win and the big guy really upset. And so the original narrative had always been just that, that big investors define the game. They mm. define how the market and the stocks are going to operate. But the little guy said, you know what, I think we have a little bit of power and social media has given us an ability to change those economic narratives. Mm -hmm. So as I read this book, that's the story that really came to mind as how a narrative can completely shift mm. just based on how the person telling the story is able to change it. Yeah, very mm. interesting stuff.
I w you talked about inducing actions, how narratives induce actions. Yes. And I want to talk about how economic narratives, and in particular how uh, uh, vivid details within economic narratives uh, help in inducing actions. And so as human beings, we can't help it. We look to form narratives whenever and wherever we can. Uh, and, and this reminds me of a quote by Jean-Paul Sartre, who wrote once that a man is always a teller of tales. He sees everything that happens to him through them, through mm. tales, right? And so in other words, our minds shape everything. They like to cluster everything into a narrative. That's how it, it is organized. That's how it, it is persuasive. That's how it makes sense to us. But to form narratives, we need to hang, uh, uh, hang them onto particular uh, uh, details. Mm -hmm. And a case, is, a case in point here is, is, is the controlled experiment, um, and, and the author talks about this, uh, conducted in the year 1985 by cognitive psychologists uh, Brad E. Bell and Elizabeth F. Uh, Loftus. And um, here they had two groups, so participants took on the role of jury members. And the goal was to see if particular vivid details had any bearing on the way court cases were decided. Mm -hmm. So fictional cases were presented with and without uh, vivid details. Yeah. Uh, and in one of the cases, uh, the accused was said to have accidentally knocked over a bowl of guacamole onto the uh, white rock mm -hmm. during uh, the, the conduct of the crime. And that detail, seemingly irrelevant detail, apparently helped obtain a conviction <laughs> from the experimental jury. <laughs> And this image, we're told, allowed them to form a concrete picture mm. of the whole crime narrative, yeah. which would otherwise have been a very dry, colorless account. Mm -hmm. So when you say that uh, you know, so-and-so knocked over a bowl of guacamole, then the jury now, you, I mean, you literally took the jury to the scene of mm -hmm. crime, yeah. thanks to that detail. And so he um, then uh, uh, takes that uh, uh, finding and uh, extrapolates it now to the economic, uh, uh, the, you know, the world of economics in the, in, in the real world. And he says, in economic terms, particular details can help build narratives that have a dramatic effect on the decisions that people make mm. uh, on a macro scale. And he gives an example here of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Yeah. And he says, at the time, the US economy was in the middle of a recession before 9-11 even happened. And when the World Trade, Trade Center was destroyed and the Pentagon was uh, uh, badly damaged, many economists feared that this would further erode confidence in the economy. Mm. Uh, all the indicators pointed to further pain uh, a bigger recession even after 9-11. But we're told by November, just two months later, the recession was over. <laughs> um, and, and, and he attributes this to two things. Uh, the first is people watching the vivid spectacle of the attack on the symbolic buildings of the World Trade Center. Um, and you know, then their determination to res and, and their resolve not to let that uh, mm. uh, take them down mm -hmm. uh, and to instead fight it and be resilient. And the second thing, a very uh, overt statement by George W. Bush, the then president, uh, president rather, uh, who you know came out and said that we have to, uh, uh, Americans had to go out and uh, restore confidence in the economy. Mm. He said, and I quote, do your business around the country, fly and enjoy America's great destination spots. Uh, get down to Disney World in Florida mm -hmm. and so on. Just giving people uh, that morale booster, yeah. but once again through details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and with those details, they were able to turn around uh, the narrative completely yeah. for the better. Mm. True. Mm. Two things I'd like to say on what you've just said. The first is last week we learned that memory is exceedingly fickle. So those vivid details you're saying that induce action yeah. that could be planted and not yes. really yeah, induce yeah, yeah. a different yeah. action. Yeah. But the other thing I'd like to say is I think we read um, Homo sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari mm -hmm. and he says that that is what has helped Homo sapiens survive, that our ability to tell ourselves stories. Stories yes. about things like democracy yeah. and governance. Mm -hmm. And we believe these stories and we're able to survive. Yeah, so anyway, true. I'd like to talk a little bit about perennial economic narratives. These are narratives that repeat themselves over time with mutations that bring them up to date. And perennial narratives just don't completely go away. They keep popping up because the story is inherently motivating. Mm -hmm. So this story took roots, it took generations to take root and sometimes even centuries. And one example, in fact, the author gives nine examples of perennial economic narratives. But the example I'd like to focus on today is the idea that labor-saving machines will replace 
all workers yes. and cause mass unemployment. <laughs> Can you hear the people picketing, the trade yeah. unions? Can mm -hmm. you hear them? Yes. Now, this is a recurrent narrative. Mm. In that narrative, they say that the machines are said to take away your job or they'll do your mm. job for you. Mm. And this particular narrative started or it appeared in the 19th century. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. With the mechanical looms yes. that were replacing the jobs of weavers mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom yes. and what was called the Luddite movement. Mm -hmm. yes. Google it. It's very interesting. Yes. Anyway, the term then brought on the, the natural the narrative then brought on a term, labor saving machines. Mm. And this was used in reference to those mechanical looms. Mm -hmm. That term was then spread to agriculture with the introduction of the harvester. Mm -hmm. Then sometime later, the narrative mutated and changed from labor saving machines to technological unemployment. Mm -hmm. And the story here was that robots <laughs> were taking over jobs. Mm -hmm. Then that story mutated again and came back as an automation narrative in the 1950s. And the story now was that machines were controlling machines. A scientist would sit in a control room by himself, pushing buttons mm -hmm. and running a whole factory with no employees. Mm. And in, ta in our time, the 2000s, this narrative has come back once again yes. with a new and never amazing mutation. Mm. We call our mutation artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And according to the author, each narrative, each of these narratives has its own contagious element. Yeah. And the contagious element for our version, artificial intelligence, that narrative of artificial intelligence is driverless mm -hmm. cars. Yes. And the fear is centered on now if the cars drive themselves, what we taxi yeah. drivers, truck drivers, mm -hmm. what are they going to do in the future now that the cars are automated and they can drive mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. He says that the mutations that cause the recurrence of narratives can come from random accidents but more often than not they're intentional they're created by creative people including professional marketing experts mm -hmm. politicians and social media enthusiasts who have been involved in some element of their design and what makes them what makes the recurrent economic narratives tend to stick is that someone at some point told our um, media that mm -hmm. you should look at international news because they learned that if you observe the news in a foreign country mm. and what is viral in that country mm. more often than not could also be contagious in your mm. country but just like diseases and the author does compare the contagion of economics to the contagion of diseases mm -hmm. and the curve that it follows at a given time, the, the epidemics tend to be stronger in some countries than in others. That's why people are picketing about artificial intelligence in other countries, but our Matatu drivers haven't gone out protesting about the end of their careers. Mm, very true. I know. Very, would you, very Would you ever get into an automated Matatu though? No, I don't think so. I think, I think they're scary enough as it is. I if know. it's automated, yeah. I know, no. No chance. Oh, no, no way. Absolutely no way. Today we had a winning headline from The Standard and no winning headline. It's even worth mentioning. Okay. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we are on your TV screens on Pang Free to Air, Go TV and Star Times. On how to get William Ruto, I'd like to leave you with a quote. Mm. To be sure of hitting the target, shoot first, and whatever you hit is the target. Don't think about it, just do it. Do have a great evening.